We've had this debate before, Yanni and Laurel. Is that dress blue and black? Is it white and gold? Well, I have something else to mess with your mind, but there is some scientific explanation behind it. Taste greater, less filling? What? Oh, yeah, no, that's <laughs> super old school, sorry. But um, some scientists found um, that people judge things in context of what's around them. So in this particular instance, and we have two, they were given people who were agreed to be subjects in this research, a thousand people were shown series of blue and purple dots. And as they went on, the people were told there would be fewer dots that were blue, and there were, they were more purple, but people still judged those purple dots as blue, even if it was an exact shade of purple they show, were shown earlier and had identified as purple. So it seems like in this case, that it shows that context is everything. We're gonna judge things as parts of something greater as okay. opposed to objectively on their own. Okay. Science Magazine has a video that explains this a little bit better. Researchers showed non-colorblind participants a series of a thousand dots, ranging from very blue to very purple, and asked them to judge whether each dot was blue. For the first 200 trials, participants saw an equal number of dots from the blue and purple parts of the spectrum. But then the prevalence of blue dots gradually decreased to just a fraction of what it was before. By the end of the study, participants' interpretation of the colors had changed. Dots that they had thought were purple in the first set of trials, they now classified as blue. That is, their concept of the color blue had expanded to also include shades of purple. And they were offered extra money if they, if they identified them correctly, and they still perceived them as the wrong color. And this goes on in a few different ways. It's not just colors, because colors can be, you know, how does our brain perceive colors? Maybe how do our brains perceive definitions of things in general? You know, um, for instance. Well, that's, you know, real quick, that's a fascinating experiment because I think uh, there's been some, there are variations into how people will differentiate colors to begin with. And that always gets me thinking about the evolution of language and how language has, like there's a definite progression as to where words for certain colors come in. Mm -hmm. Like typically it's black, white, and then red comes in, and then maybe blue or green after that. So we're uh, spreading to the more, you know, yeah. less primary, more this is a shade of purpley. Yeah, blue. so anyway, um, sorry, tangent. Sorry. But it could also be, you know, how our, our brains work, right? Okay. Because some people are colorblind. It is a known thing. So they did another test that was led by Harvard University's Daniel Gilbert, who is a psychologist who found that people readily and unconsciously change how they define certain concepts ranging from specific colors to unethical behavior based on the frequency of how much they see them. Okay. So maybe it's not just context, maybe it's how often is it around? Have we grown to accept certain things? I mean, when we're looking at the political climate, this certainly becomes something to think about. So there was another experiment in which people looked at different faces. Uh, that were already independently rated on a continuum of very threatening to very unthreatening. And people were chose, uh, had to pick the, the threatening faces. But again, like the blue and purple test, they made the threatening faces appear more frequently and they'd find the unthreatening ones and vice versa. People perceived faces that they had already gauged to be unthreatening as threatening because they were looking for a threat because like they, they were weren't seeing enough it. of it. Okay. And we have another video on that as well. And the team found similar results in more complex versions of the task, where participants had to judge whether a face was threatening or if a research proposal was ethical. When threatening faces became less common, people started to consider previously benign examples as posing a threat. These results could explain why so many people tend to be pessimistic about the state of the world. As common problems become rare, previously minor issues start to seem much more problematic. And there was one more test, which you may find gross. So they had to do, uh, look at different proposals, research proposals, and gauge whether they were ethical or unethical. And, you know, as they, well, here's one example of something that was considered unethical. Participants will be asked to lick a frozen piece of human fecal matter. Afterwards, they will be given mouthwash. The amount of mouthwash used will be measured. 
That's unethical. That's why spelling is important. Popsicles, not poopsicles. <laughs> <laughs> a frozen piece of human waste, aka blue ice, when they're grabbed from airplanes. Um, but they shifted and rejected more ambiguous proposals than earlier in the experiment. They perceived there to be more unethical proposals, much like the poopsicles, um, than there actually were. So okay. it seems like our brains might be looking for negativity or might be contextualizing things in a different way than they might be judged objectively. That sounds similar to confirmation bias, right? Yeah. Like you're starting to look for a certain thing and your brain starts to tell you, yep, that's that thing, whether it actually is or not. But the change is really involuntary, huh. which means we are going to have to be more aware of how we judge things when we first see them and maybe not make snap judgments right away. No, that's a terrible idea. Okay, Make fine. snap judgments all the time. Fine, you know what? or go that way, you may judge your life to be worse than it is, according to this study. You loved the video. You will subscribe. You thought I was cool and charming.